Hello, welcome. My name is Erica from the British Society for Immunology. Thank you for joining us for another COVID-19 vaccine Q&A. Today, I'm joined by Dr. Bernard Talabani from Cardiff University. She's also a member of Team Halo and she's part of Muslim Doctors Kimri. So welcome, Bernard, and thank you so much for joining us. Hello, thank you for inviting me along. And let's get started with question number one. Can people who have had both jabs still transmit the virus? The answer is, if you've had both of your COVID vaccines and you've waited the, the magic two weeks after the second dose where your immune system's had a chance to build up its defences, your risk of then passing on the virus to other people is significantly lower than if you've just had the one dose or if you've had no vaccine at all. So the vaccines do reduce transmission significantly. Question number two, if you're double vaccinated, do you have less chance of getting COVID? Once you've had both your vaccines and you've had those two weeks after the second vaccine to allow your immune system a chance to develop its defences and protect you against COVID, your risk of then catching COVID is actually significantly reduced. But for the small minority who can still go on to catch COVID, the risk of hospitalisation is significantly reduced and the risk of death is reduced even more. But importantly, so is the risk of developing long COVID and so is the risk of transmitting the virus to other people. So the vaccines don't just stop you catching COVID. They reduce that risk significantly, but they also really reduce the risk of you becoming ill with COVID, either by ending up in hospital or developing long COVID. Question number three, are boosters for COVID-19 really necessary? When would we need to have this vaccine? So the people who are more at risk of needing a booster in that regard are the, are the very elderly or those who have a compromised immune system because their protection from the vaccine doesn't last as long or they don't get as much of a protection from it to begin with as somebody who's young, fit and healthy and has a healthy immune system. So those for those individuals that might be a risk of needing a kind of a top up of what COVID is so that their immune system can reboost itself and remind itself what COVID is, there is some discussion currently that they might need to be um, considered for a booster vaccine in the autumn term when we also vaccinate for flu, for example. The other scenario in which we might need to consider offering a booster shot is if we have a, a variant of concern that the vaccines don't provide any protection against. But at the moment, all the variants that we know about, including the Delta variant, which is the most dominant form, the, the most dominant variant in the UK, the vaccines do provide really good protection against but we need to have had both doses. Question number four, how long do vaccines confer protection? So we have evidence that people who have actually developed COVID itself, um, that the majority of them will develop some immunity, some protection from COVID lasting at least 10 months. And we have that data and that's reassuring. And what we know is the vaccines always provide better and better immunity and more long lasting immunity than natural infection. So we can say from that data that we will have at least 10 months worth of protection from the vaccine, but we don't have the data to say definitively how long that protection will last for. Question number five, what do we know about how effective the vaccines are for transplant patients? So we know that people who have transplants were not included in the original clinical trials. But this is a really good example of why we continue to collect data once we make a new vaccine or a new treatment available for the general public. And this is what we call real world data. So looking at the real world data, we know that first of all, the mortality rate for people who have had transplants and who then contract COVID is very, very high. It's around 40%. This is without the vaccination. So this is actually really, really worrying. And one of the reasons for this is because if you've had a transplant, you have to have medications to keep that transplant safe called immunosuppression, immunosuppression treatment. Um, but obviously, by definition, that then suppresses your immune system. We do have data from thousands of people who've been followed up after they've had both doses of the COVID vaccine and waited those two weeks to develop those, that good protection following the vaccine. And the risk of them then actually contracting COVID reduces significantly to 1%. So only 1% of the thousands of people who've had both vaccines then go on to contract COVID. And of that, the mortality, so of that 1%, only 8% go on to die. So actually the mortality risk after you've had both COVID vaccines is significantly lower because you've had your vaccines if you've had a transplant. Question number six, does the vaccine make long COVID better or worse? 
We have no evidence that the vaccines make long COVID worse, but we do have some evidence that actually the vaccines help. So a pilot study looked at this and, and, and we saw in that study that people who had their first dose, um, about a third, a quarter to a third of people who had their first dose had um, an improvement in their long COVID symptoms after their first dose, but then their, those symptoms came back but after their second dose, they had that improvement again. So for some people, we're seeing evidence that the COVID vaccines actually improve symptoms of long COVID. But at the moment, there is a study going on looking at um, giving repeated doses of the COVID vaccine to people who, are, um, who have long COVID to see what that does to their symptoms and then also to recovery. Question seven, can we use two vaccines with the same mechanism? For the first and second dose so for example the Pfizer and then the Moderna. So there has been um, a small study that, that published um, data looking at mixing and matching vaccines and what that study showed was actually mixing and matching vaccines um, demonstrated a better immune response in people who had different vaccines for their first and their second dose but it also showed that those people had more side effects. When we say side effects, we mean the mild, temporary, reversible side effects. But it was a small study. And so for that reason, the advice currently in the UK is to have the same vaccine for your first and your second dose. That said, there are some countries around the world, such as Canada, where they are mixing and matching vaccines. So I guess the answer is we don't know at the moment whether you can do that from a scientific perspective but the advice within the UK is to have the same vaccine for the first and the second but we do have data incoming from Canada that will hopefully give us some more information as to whether we can do some more mixing and matching. Question eight, do we have Covid vaccines for ages 18 and below? So Pfizer is, has been conducting a clinical trial looking at giving the COVID vaccine to children aged six and above, and they've already published their data for children aged 12 to 15. That data has been looked at by the MHRA, which is the governing body in the UK that looks at all clinical trial data. And um, once they're happy that the data looks good and has proven that this treatment, this vaccine in this case, is safe for that age group and effective, then they say that's fine, that age group can have it. So the MHRA has advised that 12 to 15 year olds are, are okay to have the COVID vaccine, the Pfizer vaccine in particular. What then happens is the JCVI, which is a joint vaccine for the Joint Committee for Vaccine and Immunization, have to look at the data as a whole and see whether we should offer that vaccine to that age group. So the advice currently is if you're aged 12 to 16, then you can have the Pfizer vaccine if you fall into the category of having a certain underlying condition. So for example, 12 to 15 year olds who have um, learning disability or who have other underlying health problems will be offered the vaccine. But 12 to 15 year olds who are routinely otherwise healthy will not be offered the vaccine currently. That advice may change. If we can vaccinate enough of the adult population and we achieve herd immunity for the whole population, then we may not need to even offer the vaccine to children because they will get the indirect benefit, the indirect um, protection of herd immunity. And the final question has come from Twitter. Are the vaccines effective? The answer is yes. So if you have both doses of the COVID vaccine and you've had those two weeks to allow your immune system to derive the protection and the benefit of the vaccine, then your risk of catching COVID drops significantly. But even if you do catch COVID, your risk of being hospitalised drops even more. So the risk of being hospitalised with COVID once you've been fully vaccinated is significantly lower. Your risk of dying from COVID is vanishingly small if you've had your vaccination. Your risk of developing long COVID is also reduced. Your risk of transmitting COVID is significantly lower. And if we vaccinate enough people in the population that the virus doesn't have a chance to spread at the rate that it's currently spreading, then we also suppress um, the risk of new mutant variants from developing. Because all of the current variants of concerns all appeared before the mass vaccine rollout. And they all appeared in areas um, where the rate of spread and the rate of transmission was significantly high. Um, so that's why we are vaccinating people. Thank you so much, Bernard. Those are really great answers. And thank you everyone for your questions. Please do keep following the BSI and tune in again. I'm sure we'll be back. But thank you so much, Bernard. It's nice to see you. Thank you very much for inviting me to answer questions.
I'm fortunate enough as a result of my training um, to be able to understand the science around these vaccines and to be able to decipher the difference between something that's misinformation and what is accurate information. And so knowing that, knowing the science and understanding the science around these vaccines meant that I didn't hesitate one second to have both my vaccines. Um, so if you do have any questions and concerns, please reach out and um, ask us any, any questions that you have or any concerns that you have. And thank you very much.